Dear all, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of World Academy of Art and Science. And who am I? Uh, Elif Çepni. Uh, I am the Dean of Business School in Karabük University and also UNESCO Chair Holder on Anticipation Studies, Futures Literacy and Strategic Foresight. And also it's a great pleasure, happiness, honor for me to be the Fellow of World Academy of Art and Science. Um, so, um, dear uh, colleagues, dear friends, I am planning to uh, give seven minutes to each of our panelists, and then uh, we can have three more extra minutes to uh, answer Q&A, questions and uh, answer part. We need to uh, put some time to this part as well. So our uh, question that we need to discuss, as you all know, how can a new paradigm in global education be a powerful catalyst and lever for achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and human security for all? Uh, as you all know, in our traditional education, we use a uh, Newtonian paradigm, which means that uh, value, neutrality, certainty, stability, uh, so, this is the accepted worldview in education. So predictability, uh, which we need very much. But in the 21st century, we need some new skills, 21st century skills uh, related with sustainable development goals. So uh, how, because we live in networks uh, in a very complex uh, environment, and our problems are very interconnected and interrelated. So um, how we can uh, equip our students with the skills of the 21st century, some of them are uh, creativity, self-direction, ICT literacy, health and well-being literacy, environmental literacy, there are a lot. You are going to talk on this, I'm sure. And uh, without losing time, let's start discussing about this issue, how we can uh, add some new things to our common traditional uh, education system. Uh, okay, let's start with, uh, I, I, Philo, uh, are you here with us? Yes, yes, I'm okay. here. Okay, okay, so perhaps we can, if you don't mind, we can start with you, if it is okay, if you are not ready, we can, uh, go to the next uh, speaker. Okay, Fido is here with us. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask you kindly first to introduce yourself shortly, okay. and then the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, my apologies for the delay in joining. Uh, I'm Philo Magdalene, a uh, youth mentor at the POC movement. Uh, it is a youth, it, it, it is an, indeed an honor for me to share this space, uh, an important space with such eminent panelists and I'd like to thank the World Academy of Art and Science and Dr. Ash Pachauri for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Ash Pachauri is the founder and senior mentor of the POP Protect Our Planet movement, an NGO based in the US. And since he's traveling, I'm in his place as a panelist today. Um, I would just like to take a minute and I begin. Um, yes. Um, I believe the session, uh, what we're trying to envision today through this session is a new paradigm in global education that can trust us towards the UN SDGs and human security. Um, I am no educator or an academic or a policy expert to comment on education at a global or systemic level. But what I can try to do is uh, share some insights on education and youth leadership that we learned through our work at the POC movement. Um, I'm a, like I said, I'm a youth mentor at the POP movement where POP stands for Protect Our Planet. Uh, POP is a not-for-profit youth-centric organization which was founded on Earth Day in 2016 by Dr. Rajendra Kumar Pachauri, who was the former chairman of the IPCC uh, and who also found, uh, won, won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize. Uh, he believes that youth are the most uh, single most important stakeholders who can powerfully work to protect our planet. And uh, he believes strongly in the aspect of knowledge which comes to education. When I first joined POP Movement in early 2019, looking at Dr. Pachauri and his team work to build POP Movement, I realized that leadership is not a power to be hold, but a responsibility that each one of us carry, whether we are conscious of it or not, whether we own up to it or not. And this kind of leadership that puts us in the driving seat to push for SDGs and human security only comes from a well-grounded and holistic education 
that makes us personally, socially, environmentally, and politically aware. And the youth in particular, with the 1.8 billion of us between the ages 10 and 24, with the right motivation, exposure, and knowledge, all of which only comes to education, this group can have the greatest influence to effect change through their leadership of every day. The POP movement strives for such a kind of movement with primary focus on youth leading multi-sectoral action that is inspired by knowledge through education. Uh, it particularly aims at initiating youth-led community efforts to address environmental issues through implementing innovative solutions, adopting le sustainable lifestyles, implementing local education programs in schools and college communities. Um, when I was a kid, my friends and I were told that we can either be a doctor or an engineer. It seemed like whatever we studied was aimed to reach that career pinnacle. And aspects like social ethics and leadership were merely um, ornamental byproducts of that education. That wasn't a big deal. But at the POP movement, I found that leadership can be so much more. Uh, through many examples of youth, I found that to address the environmental crisis, we need leadership in many forms. We need leadership at uh, in the form of lifestyle and behavioral changes, low carbon consumer choices. We need leadership at the local and community level with focus on education, community mobilization and advocacy. We need leadership at the institutional level with colleges, universities uh, and schools being models for climate action and sustainability. We need a leadership that informs and supports climate science research and climate education. We need also leadership that openly and vigorously calls for immediate action, drives ambition and ensures that climate commitments are being acted upon and realized. Uh, we need leadership that actively participates in the decision making at the local, regional and global levels. I think that at the end of the day, we need, uh, especially in the context of human security, uh, minimizing the risks around us, we need much of everything. We need youth activists just as much as we need youth ecopreneurs we need community leaders just as much as we need youth in policy making. And only a well grounded and comprehensive education that is contextual and tailored to the needs of a geography and the community, uh, it, only that can help us achieve that. Uh, there are many examples of uh, youth from the pop movement that I can share to showcase this, but I don't think we have the time for that. Uh, but one thing that we have clearly observed through all of these examples is that. Uh, when given adequate support and motivation, uh, which only comes to education. Like I said, young people unhesitatingly take the lead, drive innovation and ground level action. With the right kind of education, their unmatched potential and drive can break inertia of any kind when it comes to driving progress. Um, while I have no insights on what uh, a new paradigm in global education can contain, I, feel, I believe that uh, when we, are when we are envisioning something like that, we should definitely consider something like, in what ways can youth leadership emerge and be promoted through education? What are the spheres where youth can be empowered to contribute in? Uh, what kind of mentorship and support do youth require from different stakeholders in society? Uh, that uh, a kind of mentorship that they can, uh, exposure that they can receive even from the initial stages of their schooling. Uh, from different stakeholders, such as politicians, researchers, policymakers, business leaders, and other members, uh, including journalists and civil society. Uh, we should also consider in what ways youth can be equipped to incorporate um, UN SDGs and concepts of human security into the career that they choose, and also uh, that they be equipped to overcome the challenges and impediments they face in their efforts, regardless of whatever career they choose. Um, all of these questions become relevant as we go. And I feel like this is just a starting point. And we have so many examples already around us that can help us. So we don't have to start from scratch, but build on existing many examples. So I'd like to end with that. Thank you. OK, thank you so much, Pilo. Uh, your contributions are really so important. You uh, said that we all trust young generation very much. And this sustainability is uh, the, uh, the to improve the quality of 
future generations' life, not to be selfish, because if we deplete all our resources today, our previous generations left us lots of resources. So it's our responsibility to uh, leave at least similar amount of resources to the next generations. And that's why today's teenagers, today's youth, the, this is so important for us. Okay, quickly, I would like to pass to the second speaker of our panel. Sonia, are you ready for your uh, speech? The floor yes. is yours. Thank you very much. Could Thank you. you please very quickly introduce yourself. Sonia yes. is uh, from Sasa Saturn uh, organization, I think very interesting one, philanthropic uh, organization. Please introduce yourself and then uh, let's listen to your ideas. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Elif, for the introduction and to Philo for your words on youth empowerment. I really appreciate this opportunity and thank the World Academy of Arts and Science. My name is, as you said, Sonia Gomez de Mesquita, Deputy Chair of Sasa Seton. So who we are? Our philanthropic educational and social organization develops educational programs for hospitalized children in Israel to ensure hospi hosp uh, hospitalization doesn't uh, stand in the way of education. In over 13 years, Sasa Seton has provided educational solutions to nearly 2 million hospitalized children from all parts of Israeli society in every hospital in the state of Israel. We operate in collaboration with the Israeli Ministry of Education under the National Free Education for Sick Children law, the only law of its kind in the world to our knowledge. The Free Education for Sick Children law ensures that every child in Israel receives free education and learning continuity, even if hospitalized. Therefore, every one of Israel's 41 hospital has a school with a principal and teachers, a full team staff member. We operate in all the 41 hospital schools all over the state of Israel in 25 general hospital schools called the afternoon school we extend the school day after this the school day after 12 o'clock in eight psychiatric hospital called the school of life we offer year round educationally and emotionally enriching programs and in eight palliative care hospitals called the school of light we offer programs for children in rehabilitative and complex nursing hospitals in all these hospitals, schools Sasa Seton's ability to build human and community security and resilience comes to light. At Sasa Seton, we see it as a, our universal duty to promote personal security, especially among children. By creating tailored pedagogical programs, we ensure hospitalization doesn't come at the expense of education. Sasa Seton also uses hospital schools to promote inclusive dialogue among members of Israeli society, regardless of their religious, ethnic, or socioeconomic background. We take a holistic approach, serving everyone involved in educating the hospitalized child, the children, their families, the educational and the medical staff. I'm sure that at least some of you are familiar with the experience of hospitalized ch uh, child. The uncertainty, the disruption of routine and the disconnect from the community and the daily environment negatively affect a child's well-being. Furthermore, many studies prove that mental resilience plays a significant role in successful recovery from physical trauma. Therefore, our programming is much more than catching up on schoolwork. Children need a positive distraction and sense of uh, normalcy, a moment to relax, laugh, and be in safe and happy and healing environment. The hospital education offered by Sasa Seton has this design principle in mind to ensure enjoyable learning while mitigating educational gaps during hospitalization. Our mission is to ensure that when these kids return home, it is a seamless transition, transition in every aspect, emotional, social, educational, and uh, familial and familiar. Sasa Seton does this in six ways, very short. First, developing innovative learning spaces in hospitals 
with state-of-the-art technology suitable for hospitalized children. Innovative learning spaces are created in a bottom-up process. For example, our learning spaces have medical simulators to help kids prepare for their procedures. In eating disorder words, we created an open art studio and much more examples. Second, tailoring individualized education programs to each child according to their hospitalization type, whether it's psychiatric, whether it's general hospitalization, and whether it's uh, palliative care. Much of the curriculum is fun. It is delivered in bite sizes and includes lesson in 3D printing, animation, scientific experiments, robotics, brain teaser, juggling, music, art, and much more. Third, at Sasa Seton, we approach hospital schools as a microcosm of Israeli society. Therefore, diversity is celebrated and our education is designed to create bridges. We currently offer our programming in Hebrew, in Arabic, and now in Ukraine, uh, in Ukrainian, sorry, and are in the process of adding English very, very soon. Fourth, throughout the year, we enrich our academic staff in hospital schools through training in innovative learning tools and materials. For example, we offer them language training, 3D printing, and much more. Fifth, we maintain regular contact with the child's origin school and homeroom class to ensure they are up to date with the curriculum of their peers. Finally, SASA has extended its reach internationally for the first time during the war in Ukraine. We have flown academic staff and led educational programming to ensure Ukrainian children can continue their educational and social routine as much as possible. In Odessa's largest children's hospital, we built an innovative learning environment like the ones in Israel in Israeli hospitals. To close my remarks, the educational system Sasa set on leads in hospital schools profoundly impacts hosp hospitalized children and teens. Their experience will shape their immediate environment and create ripple effects on the broader society. Developing the resilience of hospitalized children is a, a recipe for creating long-term long personal and community security. This is our duty as a socio-educational organization. In Israel, we are proud to have successfully enshrined the importance of giving an educational solution to every hospitalized child as a core component of their recovery process and resilience building. While Israel is unique for its free education for hospitalized children law, our experience in Sasa in Odessa shows that Sasa Seton's model can be exported internationally. We are happy to collaborate with partners to protect the rights of hospitalized children globally. I am glad that Sasa Seton is part of this dialogue and look forward to learning about other unique educational activities worldwide aimed at building human security. I held my time. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. You are very punctual. Thank you so much. Uh, just on time. Uh, this is unbelievable, amazing activities of your organization. It can be taken as an example for many other countries and uh, local communities as well. Hope uh, what you are doing uh, can be heard and can be seen by others. So because these are so important for especially for uh, not only for human security, for hospitalized uh, children, even, I mean, how important it is. So congratulations. And uh, let's now, uh, Milos from the University of Belgrade, if I might write. Uh, Milos, yes. could you please very shortly introduce yourself and then let's uh, hear your beliefs, ideas, and explanations about our main topic. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you kindly. My name is Milos Nitric. Uh, I'm coming from University of Belgrade, from more specifically Faculty of Political Science, and even more specifically from the Center for Cultural Studies at the university, at the faculty actually, uh, where we basically deal with the academic uh, research of what is understood as culture in terms of way of life. Uh, but uh, without any further ado, 
uh, I would also like to share my enthusiasm for being with you today. And I mean, it's really difficult to uh, come after this fantastic uh, expose of Sonia and their work that is of paramount importance. And I believe it really tops many other very important topics. Uh, but nevertheless, I will speak to you today about something that is really on top of my heart and uh, it might come as a surprise, but it is tourism. So what I'm going to do is uh, start and uh, you will find out why I'm going to talk about tourism today. Uh, dear Milos, before you start, I would like to remind the participants of this panel, not to panelists, but uh, to everyone, uh, you can uh, write your questions, if you have any, to the, in the chat box, and even you can share your own ideas uh, by, by sending messages to all of us. I would just, I would like to remind you that uh, there is no question in our chat box, but you can feel free to put your questions there. Okay, Milos, thank you so much. and sorry for interruption. No, no, uh, thank you for, for this remark. And uh, uh, thanks to all the organizers for this wonderful event. So, um, uh, uh, once again, dear colleagues, uh, since we have rather limited time here, I will make this an activist presentation rather than an academic talk, something that I'm more uh, used to doing regularly. So I'm here today to make my case that is rather simple and straightforward and that might contribute significantly to enhancing the human security on a global scale in the future. I'm here to make a case for a shift in tourism education a shift from considering and teaching about tourism as an economic phenomenon seen as an object of interest of management studies approach towards a position where tourism is seen predominantly as a social and cultural phenomenon with immense powers to impact, for better or for worse, obviously, people's lives globally. A phenomenon that in this century requires humanities as much, if not more, as it requires economics and management. So why is that? Well, uh, before you, I have some numbers and facts about tourism in 2019, the last proper year before the COVID shook the whole industry. We had 1.5 billion international tourist arrivals. We had 8.9 trillion US dollars contribution to the world's GDP. It is basically 10.3% of global GDP, affecting 330 million jobs globally, which means one in 10 jobs around the world is tourism related. And again, speaking in US dollars, $1.7 trillion worth of visitors exports, which meant also around $948 billion in capital investment. So uh, we have really, really high numbers, but what, with what consequences? I'm going to name just a few. Gentrification, pollution, overconsumption, waste production, and climate change resulting from this highly accelerated uh, state of the art of the tourism industry today. In other words, something that is appearing in uh, contemporary tourism studies as over tourism, which is a term uh, signifying a contemporary term, obviously, signifying the distortions of places, communities, and their mutual ties under the weight of tourism related impacts. So, where should the change come from? We are asking ourselves constantly. And here is my critical input, especially for our panel. My belief that we need, the, the, the world needs a proper shift of narrative when it comes to tourism. So tourism, as we have seen, became one of the major world industries and surely it requires managerial professions to make the best of it. But making the best of it in the 21st century lies outside the scope of tourism economics, return on investments and endless expansion. It lies in the field of understanding tourism as a global social activity that should lead towards the strengthening of peace bonds between peoples and nations, thus directly minimizing multiple threats 
to human security, which some of them are obviously related to the land, to the atmosphere, and something that we call now the Anthropocene, so uh, the, the human impact on the, the, the world, uh, the physical world we live in. So a vocal proponent of such an approach is International Institute for Peace Through Tourism, an institution dedicated to fostering travel and tourism initiatives that contribute to international understanding, cooperation among nations, and improved quality of environment, cultural enhancement, and the preservation of heritage, poverty reduction, reconciliation, and healing wounds of conflicts. And through these initiatives, helping to bring about a peaceful and sustainable world. So what shift does tourism education require in order to achieve this that we have just said? I believe it's a shift to humanities, a critical studies. What does this mean? These mentioned potentials can be achieved only when tourism is understood not solely as economic, but predominantly as social and cultural activity. Humanities with its people-centered approach and critical dimension can broaden up the understanding of the phenomenon that impacts us all, whether we participate in it or not, and the forces that shape it in the present, making sure that the forces shaping it in the future will be the ones that enhance human security, not impede it. So in other words, a shift from education for tourism towards travel as education. Travel as an open window into cultural, natural, spiritual, and other diversities of the world. Thank you very much. Milos, thank you so much. Uh, your contributions are really uh, unbelievable. We never thought about tourism in this sense. You mentioned about over tourism distortions of touristic activities, but how we can change our behaviors uh, to use tourism in a sustainable way for social cultural activities and how we can shift, uh, cause this paradigm shift through tourism education. So thank you so much. Uh, thank we you. enjoyed this uh, very much. And our next uh, panelist speaker is uh, Natalia. Uh, <clears throat> you have lots of adjectives, composer, pianist, conductor, uh, writer, artist. So from Music Karabi, if my pronunciation is right, Project International, could you please shortly introduce yourself and the floor is yours. We would like to hear your uh, speech. Thank you very much for this great honor to be uh, a part of this uh, significant uh, uh, conference uh, organized by World Academy of Art and Science. I am happy to be with you and um, I, am, uh, I am a composer, yes, and head of the uh, Guild of Young Art Creators. And since I work here, I can say that our educational activity is aimed at teaching as many people of different ages, especially an early age, as possible to think creatively, uh, largely and peacefully. Uh, and of course, we support them to realize their potential most fully to open new horizons for them and the, the ability to act united for the benefit of people and uh, our entire planet. We organize interdisciplinary multicultural educational projects, events related to the interaction of different types of art and also develop new methods uh, for the field in, of com complete effective uh, study and understanding of our multi-rich multilateral world in its entire volume and depth. Uh, with like-minded people, we have um, achieved uh, tangible positive results in this direction. Uh, for example, a cultural-oriented uh, art way method for learning languages through music has established itself uh, very well. This allows to reduce the terms of language learning to make the acquired knowledge more durable and at the same time uh, get aesthetic, spiritual and moral enlightenment. We are 
uh, being involved uh, all the time and um, increasingly include international cooperation in our activities. Uh, this primarily concerns our cooperation with the Musical.ly Project International and the International Alliance for Women in Music based in the United States. As part of these initiatives, we managed to implement many valuable educational and cultural projects uh, that only strengthen the mutual understanding, solidarity, and consent in the minds of people as well as human security as a whole. Uh, we adhere to firm convictions that the security and harmonious progress of humanity must be based on, on the race of the significance of culture. Uh, it, it should be a new cultural and creative oriented era. Uh, culture is the main thing that makes us a true human being, uh, homo culturalis or a cultural person, which means uh, spiritually elevated. Only he is able to build uh, that perfect bright future to which we all aspire. Uh, culture uh, means cultivation, and it is based on a term used by the ancient Roman orator Marcus Tullius Cicero. He wrote of a cultivation of the soul using an agricultural metaphor for the development of a philosophical soul understood uh, tel uh, tel uh, teleological as the highest possible ideal of human development. He also spoke about the culture of spirit and mind, which are equivalent to love of wisdom that are the definition of philosophy. No wonder uh, is uh, in ancient, ancient schools, along with the exact science and the humanities, rhetoric, music, painting, philosophy were obligatory. Without this, it is impossible to form an integrated and harmonious personality. Uh, the German philosopher and journal, uh, jurist Samuel Poffendorf uh, postulates that culture refers to all the ways in which human beings overcome their original barbarism and uh, through artifice become fully, fu fully human. Um, and uh, we are all and everything that surrounds us to infinity are united by one mind and constitute one whole together with the entire universe. And culture creates a cultural field that connects us, uh, establishing our harmonious interaction with, with each other and with the outside world. Therefore, only an increase in the level of culture can stop the spiritual decline, uh, discord in society. A cultural person will be honest both to the outside, outside world and to himself. He will be reasonable and his choice will be a rational consumption and responsibly uh, restor uh, restoration of all resources of uh, the earth and caring about people, all this will help to make the world truly humanistic, in which the problems of uh, violence will be solved by themselves. And uh, this will save present and future generations from the threat and disaster of aggression and destruction. Uh, this is where culture leads, and uh, this is the surest way and key to all the changes facing humanity today. Uh, I think, and um, if we underst underestimate or lose sight of the fundamental importance of culture, we will never fully achieve uh, and realize the noblest goals, which are the 17th sustain sustainable development goals. And uh, there is such a danger. In, in due time, Immanuel Kant seeing the rapid development of civilization already then alarmingly noted its separation from culture, which also uh, goes forward, but much more slowly. Uh, according to him, it is uh, this disproportion that is uh, the cause of many of the troubles of ma mankind. Since the cultural space is essentially and inextricably linked uh, to social life. The modern educational program urgent, uh, ar urgently needs uh, cultural content and should include an in-depth study of ethics, aesthetics, cult world cultural traditions and heritage, examples of high classical and professional contemporary art and the practical application of creative skills. And since art 
is the highest manifestation of culture embedded, embedded with, uh, with it, we will become to the creators of the best uh, version of ourselves, as well as the entire harmonious reality around us. Unlike the scientific method of cognition with the divides of the world into separate parts for analytics, the artistic sphere follows the path, path of holistic and uh, synthesized uh, display by creating some uh, complex models where they establish established accents uh, of, of the position of good and evil are placed, that which contributes to their unification and understanding. Also, this is the atmosphere of high spirituality, beauty and creativity that is uh, native to the child's soul in which he feels happy, feel protected and confident. Also, we uh, noticed that the child becomes more developed, developed intellectually and spiritually, more emotionally response, uh, responsive, sincere, sensitive, inspired, his insight and intuition develop highly. Uh, we adults, ad, ad, uh, we adults uh, uh, who's, who have already embarked on our own, own path must help the child remain a miracle, feel him the guide of the world of beauty. Then the little man will open his heart and it will never become callous if, uh, even during period of major challenges. He will be filled with noble and high ideas and will be able to create a happy life, not only for himself and his loved ones, but also uh, make the contribution to improving the life of all mankind. It is especially important to give this main impulse to, from, from childhood, may, uh, maintaining in child the poor divine light in, uh, of his soul uh, through, throughout his life. This is my uh, this is my main task and the responsibility to people to help this come true uh, through all my activities and all creativity. Our even brighter future is in our children who, thanks uh, to our wisdom, will be able to imbibe our ideals, continue our important undertakings, and pass them on subsequently to their children along with the prosperous world. Thank you very much for uh, invaluable attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. Uh, personally, I really enjoyed your speech very much. Uh, you mentioned uh, shortly art is the common language and to prevent barbarism, uh, uh, we need to, uh, to use a united mind and music, art, uh, aesthetics, to understand world heritage, the planet belongs to all and we can use creative, uh, to improve creative skills and uh, to develop intellectual capacity of uh, people. Uh, we need uh, cultural education or art and music uh, education. So uh, I totally agree with you. And uh, I would like to now turn to Mariana Todorova. Uh, Mariana actually is the uh, former member of parliament of Bulgarian parliament and a futurist and now is working on, uh, on a project which is known Millennium Project, a very interesting, very important project. Uh, Mariana, the floor is yours. Uh, you can also add if you want to introduce yourself more. Uh, we are impatient to hear your speech. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm a futurist, uh, researcher, author of books about artificial intelligence and future studies. I'm consultant. Uh, I was really member of parliament uh, six years ago. I, I was advisor to the president of the Republic and I'm part of Millennium Project, which is a global futuristic think tank. Uh, many thanks to World Academy of Art and Sciences for inviting me to be part of the current discussion about rethinking education that might help to, to achieve SDGs. I really enjoyed all the previous speeches because they were different uh, use cases showing us how we can improve our current condition. And my speech will be from a more global perspective uh, because I'm futurist and I, I will give a 
another overview. And as a futurist, uh, I will present visions of the education of the future, but this also uh, obliges me to talk about the opportunities and the risks um, that it may contain. Uh, the future recently is taught primarily in a technological perspective. This mega trend of technology is so strong, uh, it's almost omnipotent potential and uh, omnipresent. And uh, this almost uh, turns into a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the same, of course, applies to education. We all witnesses the digitalization processes that were quite more accelerated uh, with the COVID pandemic. And today, it's a common place to talk about the digital classroom, which even grows into the concept of a digital station that is a set of school technologies. Of course, artificial intelligence is also rapidly entering uh, education and educational systems. Um, it was recently reported that Amazon uh, readers on the Kindle device can accumulate information about how the reader reacts to the reading through AI. For example, which passages uh, a reader read quickly and which slowly, which arouses special interests because it has been reread many, many times. And the same is uh, expected from educational platforms, which can now analyze emotion on the face, so to, to predict whether the content is understood and to adapt it to the intelligence level of each student who uses them. AI has led to the development of virtual tutors that help students uh, to prepare for tests. Uh, there is an AI that helps children not to drop out of school because it can uh, give them tons of tips how to tackle the, the learning content. Even foreign languages exams uh, can be uh, uh, assisted uh, to be uh, learned quickly by AI, or uh, AI uh, is possible to teach now more complex mathematics and build an individual approach to the capabilities of, of each student. Uh, student now, uh, students now use robot teachers, uh, virtual teachers, um, uh, they also uh, can step into antiquity and develop strategic thinking uh, if they use military as they are military strategies using uh, gamified history lessons via virtual reality or uh, immersive reality. Uh, again, through VR, medical students can see and practice through simulation over 3,000 types of surgical operations. Lessons in history and geography, even physics and chemistry uh, could be provided by different experience through gamification. Uh, some of the participants in the, in the previous discussions mentioned 3D printing when uh, students can program and print their own projects. Uh, and generally, we, we can say that through the new technologies, uh, education can acquire new dimensions, be individualized, students can perceive new skills, uh, and that might be one of the directions of achieving a new paradigm shift and to find ways to solve some of the SDGs issues. But we should also consider that these are ju just technological means and the education is one of the ways to acquire among the most important human skills, uh, which is critical thinking. Uh, and this critical thinking uh, can now be reinforced, but also endangered by AI, for example. And we need to reassemble education in order to respond to all these challenges. And we have to, to pose uh, variety of questions and try to answer them. Uh, one of the most important questions we need to answer is, uh, does all these processes, uh, all these process lead to the irreversible dehumanization of education process? And especially in, in its socializing and inclusive part. 
And the technology lead to cognitive impatience and cognitive decline because everyone now uh, talks about chat GPT. It really already challenges the education system. And the smallest problem is that uh, students are using it to cheat and to end the plagiarism. The fundamental problem is that it provides easy shortcuts, the so-called heuristics in, in uh, cognitive sciences. And uh, this is our easy answers for every problem or issue. And ChatGPT can only give guidance and foundations but not in-depth knowledge. And this can enhance even more cognitive impatience, which is uh, due to the usage of uh, social media and result in cognitive decline. If students or ordinary people start to lose their ability to analyze, to keep uh, their researches in survey in depth or to uh, deny uh, the critical thinking. And we have also to answer some additional questions. What kind of institution should the school and university be in the background of observed social, cultural, and economical changes? And what is the place of digital in this transformation? Because we could not uh, uh, focus uh, digital only uh, as the only way to go. And what would be the main focus of education? Socializing, because people are becoming more and more alienated. Um, therapeutic, because children and students now encounter mental problems such as tension and depression. Intellectual, because still students need to have a high level of knowledge in the new increasingly competitive world or training because for example uh, children and students are accepted to be uh, activists and to provide answers to to different um, different questions and what or who will be the person like at the exit of school education and how to redefine the concept of maturity because children are now increasingly expected to be more mature at, at, at an early age um, and how the relations between knowledge and skills continue to be reconfigured and what is the place of the teacher or the uh, uh, university uh, lecturer in that context uh, because uh, we need to consider that there is a danger of blurring the line between uh, knowledge and entertainment in the view of the trend toward gamification or easy getting of knowledge and we need to preserve the the, the social nature of the learning process because uh, we could not uh, undermine the digital means of uh, personalized learning. And uh, we, should, uh, we should answer all this question uh, to, uh, to enable um, us and the, uh, the problems to find a balance between the new technology and the traditional approach and to remain, that, uh, uh, to remain the system uh, human-centric. Otherwise, it will be uh, just self-purpose to, to go on uh, digital, uh, by, by only digitalization and to lose other important uh, uh, quality uh, skills and, and uh, abilities we have. And we could not uh, be sure that um, the new paradigm could be only assisted by our uh, digital technologies. And uh, that was uh, my input for uh, today's sessions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mariana. You raised very important questions that we need to find answers and also we need to find consensus. Perhaps, uh, yes, we, there must be a balance between the use of new technologies, but also the skills that make us human. So as you mentioned, the use of new technologies caused lots of um, loss of flexibility, alienation, and some problems, but still it depends on us. Uh, we can write the code of conduct, ethical rules of how to use technology, uh, but 
as, a, as an academician uh, teaching for more than 25 years at the universities, perhaps in the future our students will not need us. If you have an access to internet and you can know, uh, you can speak English, you can learn whatever you want uh, from the academicians of the Ivory Tower universities, perhaps. But instead of resisting change, we need to adjust, adapt ourselves to these changes. So technology, uh, yes, uh, we can use it in a right way or a wrong way. And the questions that you raised are so important. So preserving social aspect of our education and uh, the balance between the use extensive use of new technologies and traditional uh, ways of teaching. Dear participants, um, I couldn't see any question in our uh, chat box, but if you want to share some of your ideas, I'm, I, will, I would like to turn to our panelists because still you can add, uh, contribute, make some contributions. Uh, Milos raised a hand. Uh, all others, you can also uh, share with us because after listening all panelists, it could be better for you to add some extra points. Milos, please. Thank you. I will be very, very brief. Um, th th there have been a couple of things that sort of interconnect more or less in a general way our worries. And if I might put them towards something that's close to me, then uh, that would be uh, uh, one, what makes us human, and we in a way identified creativity as something that is uh, specifically human, which is debatable, but let's take it for this moment that it is, human creativity, and then critical studies or critical thinking, not studies, critical thinking as a tool for finding your way around the digital jungle, as we are now really living in a like uh, the, 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 the most liberalized a state of digital and not only digital but technology uh, in a way so critical thinking i believe very soon is going to be translated into digital literacy uh, so if you cannot think critically you are going to be lost within a month of uh, spending your time in this digital jungle so in this way and also applying the critical thinking i would really like to thank natalia for bringing up culture as something that's rather important important in our discussions today, but also I would like to uh, direct the attention that this has been an age old uh, topic and there have been many debates around the position of culture in what makes us human. And uh, also this is a very particular paradox in which culture as a notion is separating us from everything else on the planet. But at this, so it's a unifying thing but at the same time, culture is something that is separating us among ourselves as a, a notion of which is a rather outdated uh, view. So in these terms, I would be very, very careful to make, you know, uh, in a way, comparison between cultural participation and uh, a reasonable application of creative skills. Uh, this is something that has maybe not stood the, the test of time in various social situations. What I would direct my attention to is the creativity in each particular social setting. So uh, I would direct the, the, the focus and put the gravity on creativity, not culture per se. And uh, I believe that what we have been talking about now is really bringing us back to something that is again critical thinking and i would uh, I, well i would suggest our uh, our colleagues or anyone interested to read a bit of philosophy there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of very good analytical knowledge in in, in 20th century philosophy that we could apply to our uh, problems in the future thank you Thank you, uh, Milos. Is there anyone else who would like to add uh, some extra points? Yes, Mariana, please. Just to add to and to agree with Milos that uh, philosophy is a good way to, to start from. Uh, before I became a futurist, I've graduated cultural studies and uh, analytical philosophy. And it really uh, helps me a lot to prepare my uh, scenarios, uh, forecasts, uh, and, and uh, trend tracking, because uh, analytical philosophy is the broadest base for critical thinking and for analyzing uh, different phenomena. And uh, 
we should be more and more uh, self-disciplined to keep us uh, uh, in the frame of critical thinking and and to, to be patient and to not to follow the shortcuts but the the, the long path uh, towards knowledge because uh, otherwise we just will be uh, uh, biological algorithms and we will uh, lose our sentience and, and consciousness. Thank you so much, Mariana. Uh, is there anyone else? Uh, our, um, okay, we needed to finish at five, uh, 5.50 uh, Central European time, but the next uh, session will start luckily at uh, 18 uh, CET. Uh, dear uh, colleagues, uh, dear panelists, uh, I really would like to thank all of you, uh, especially to our panelists and people joined us today. And I would like to also celebrate International Women's Day uh, of our women participators, but I also believe he for she uh, uh, support as well. Uh, thank you so much, Yulas. Thank you. Uh, and perhaps we, we, we need uh, a new paradigm. Perhaps just instead of teaching predictability, we may start teaching uh, unpredictability because we are surrounded with unknown unknowns, discontinuous events, how we can enjoy them. And uh, instead of creating stress, not to know the future. And um, we can together uh, through uh, art, through science, uh, cybernetics, the combination of all disciplines, we can create wealthier, happier, healthier future generations. For sure, the basic line is human security for all. And I would like to thank to the organizers of this conference. Uh, I shared with you at the beginning of the uh, panel that it's a great proud happiness for me to be the fellow of was so uh, I would like to thank them as well to appoint me as the um, panel moderator it's a great pleasure to meet with all of you and hope to see you in our next uh, perhaps meetings and conferences uh, take care of yourself stay safe and bye for now